you live anywhere south of a line between, say, San Antonio and Houston, I think this was the trial of the century. Selena, a wonderful, talented, young lady, was dead. But whoever caused that, something bad was probably going to happen to her. She trusted too much. And I think Yolanda Saldivar used that to her advantage. I don't think Selena knew or understood what this woman was capable of. It was just before noon on March 31st, 1995 in Corpus Christi, Texas. At the Days Inn Motel in the city's industrial section, the maintenance man was collecting tools to fix a dryer. I heard this loud bang, like a flat tire, and, and uh, like a blowout. A young Hispanic woman dashed across the courtyard. And I see this girl running with her hands on her chest and screaming and scared. And I see this other woman chasing her with a gun in her hand and pointing it at her back. The maintenance man watched the woman with the gun stop, lower it, and turn to walk away. The woman who'd been shot struggled into the motel lobby, where she collapsed on the floor. As shocked motel employees gathered around, the woman was recognized as Selena. No last name was necessary. Selena was Corpus Christi's biggest star, and the most acclaimed singer ever to emerge from the Tejano music scene, a style popular in the Mexican-American community. A pool of blood formed quickly beneath her. Selena murmured the words, Yolanda, room 158, then lost consciousness. The guest listed in room 158 was Yolanda Saldivar. A desk clerk gave the 911 dispatcher her name as a possible suspect. Within five minutes of the shooting, an ambulance arrived. Police followed right behind. The first officer to arrive noticed a woman sitting in a red pickup truck in the parking lot. As he approached the vehicle, the woman pulled out a gun and threatened to kill herself. Paul Rivera was the first detective on the scene. I could see a female inside the red pickup truck with a gun to her head in, the, in this position. And I said, lady, get out. We're going to help you. You know, everything will be all right. She said, no, it's not okay. Get away. Get away. You know. The police called in a hostage negotiation unit. As Selena was being rushed to the hospital, the news that she had been shot began to spread through Corpus Christi. At the time, her brother and father were grabbing a quick breakfast near their recording studio. They raced to the hospital. When I went inside the, the emergency room, I asked a policeman what, uh, what happened, you know, what, and he told me that Selena was dead. The bullet had hit an artery close to Selena's heart. She was pronounced dead at 1.05 p.m. She was 23 years old. Detective Rivera arrived at the hospital to check on Selena's condition and heard the bad news from a fellow officer. He tells me, hey, Selena died. And man, cold chill went through, my, through me, you know. Couldn't believe it. Who killed Selena was never in question. How and why it happened would become the enduring mystery of the case. At 4 p.m., with the press clamoring for information, the singer's father agreed to give a statement. And my daughter, Serena, was, <laughs> was killed this morning by a, a disgruntled employee. And uh, right now, uh, I don't know all the details. At that moment, Selena's killer, Yolanda Saldivar, was still locked in a standoff with police outside the Days Inn Motel. 
it quickly emerged that 34-year-old Saldivar was the founder of the Selena Fan Club. Speaking with police by phone, she called Selena her best friend and claimed that the shooting had been an accident, that her real intent had been to commit suicide. I brought this gun to kill myself. Not her. Oh, not her. When an eye burned into my head, she opened the door and said, Selena, close that door. And when I did that, the gun went off. Yolanda also insisted that Selena's father and manager, Abraham Quintanilla, had driven her to this desperate act. He let me do all this. He threw me out of the house. He threw me out of her life. By nightfall, hundreds of people had gathered at the Days Inn to watch the standoff unfold. For the last uh, eight hours or so, we've been negotiating with the young lady. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, we think time's on our side. We will just be patient and, and I hope that we can bring this thing to an end very quickly. After nine and a half hours, police finally convinced Saldivar to surrender. As the crowd cheered, she was taken into custody. A folk hero had been taken from them, and justice needed to be done. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. That night, under police interrogation, Yolanda Saldivar signed a confession in which she admitted to shooting Selena. But why a woman who had won the trust of one of America's most promising musical talents had then turned around and killed her remained a mystery. At the time of the murder, most of the country had never heard of Selena. But among Mexican-Americans, the 23-year-old had become a household name. She was known as the Mexican Madonna, and most expected her to follow in the footsteps of another Hispanic woman who achieved mainstream acceptance, Gloria Estefan. Selena had been shielded all her life by her father. As prosecutors prepared to put her killer on trial, it became clear that Selena simply didn't know how popular she was, and that her innocence made her all too vulnerable. Back in a moment here on A&E. Hi, the murder of Tejano music star Selena in March 1995 caused an outpouring of grief in the Mexican-American community. She was a real big role model to all of us, and I don't know, we all just loved her. We heard it like everybody in our classroom was crying and everything. We couldn't, we couldn't take it. I felt like my sister died. She, she's like a sister to me. In the days following her murder, thousands of people attended vigils assembled in Selena's honor. The motel room where she was shot and her home were quickly transformed into shrines. The Mexican-American community really has never had somebody that they can point to and say, there is one of ours, this is a person from us who, who rose up and became famous and became rich, and Selena was, was that person. <laughs> On Sunday, April 2nd, two days after the murder, Selena's casket was put on display at Corpus Christi's Convention Center. More than 50,000 people filed past the casket. She was buried the next day. As Selena was born, her killer, Yolanda Saldivar, was held under heavy guard in the Nueces County Jail. Death threats poured into the jail, and there was a rumor that the Mexican Mafia had put a bounty on her head. As prosecutors began building a murder case against Saldivar, they determined that some of the same qualities that made Selena a star had also put her at risk. 
she trusted everybody and anybody. I don't think she ever met anybody that she didn't trust immediately and like immediately. And I think that probably was one of the reasons for the for her downfall. Selena Quintanilla was born in 1971 in a small town near Houston called Lake Jackson. Her father was a clerk at the local Dow Chemical plant. Selena was the youngest of three children. Every day after work, her father would play the guitar. He discovered Selena's talent one day when the six-year-old started to sing along. She had a sense of timing, you know, with the rhythm of the music, uh, she was on pitch, and she sounded great for a six and a half year old girl. Abraham Quintanilla nurtured his daughter's talent and eventually created a band with Selena as the lead singer. Her brother, known as A.B., on bass, and her sister Suzette on drums. By the time Selena was 12, the family had moved to Corpus Christi and the band had become a family business. Selena's father decided that they should play Musica Tejana, a lively fusion of Mexican, polka, and country music. Still, the odds were against Selena ever making it big. I don't know about any other culture, but in the Latino culture, uh, there's a... Uh, a lot of male chauvinism. They didn't think that a female, especially a young female like that, could draw a big crowd. The band performed wherever Selena's father could get them gigs, state fairs, weddings, and nightclubs. They became a staple on the Tejano dance hall circuit. In 1987, the Tejano Music Awards named 15-year-old Selena female vocalist of the year. The people of Texas have voted Selena Quintanilla. Most of all, I'd like to say thank you to Grupo Los Dinos because without them, I don't think I'd be anybody. And uh, when I win, they win. And when they lose, I don't know them. Two years later, in 1989, Selena signed a contract with EMI's Latin label. Her popularity began to grow beyond the narrow confines of the Tejano market into Mexico, Latin America, and among Latinos throughout the U.S. Then, in 1991, at a concert in San Antonio, a nurse named Yolanda Saldivar saw Selena perform for the first time. Like many fans, Yolanda felt an instant attraction to Selena and the qualities she represented on stage. She was very sexy when she performed on stage and yet wholesome at the same time. There were many images that were thrown out there and whether you were a 16-year-old boy in the crowd or an 8-year-old girl or uh, a couple in their 40s, there was something that you could really uh, embrace with the band. Saldivar began calling Selena's father requesting permission to start a fan club. You know, she was really persistent. I thought it was a good idea. Even though I didn't know this person, she sounded sincere. So I gave her my blessings. I said, okay. Yolanda began setting up the club and soon found it easy to identify with the singer even more. After all, Selena was a fellow Mexican-American from a close-knit family. Now I'm a firm believer that Hispanic families are real tight. We seem to stick together, believe in real family uh, unity. And you can see by our family, we work together really well. Even though Yolanda did not have regular contact with Selena, she was thrilled by the excitement of working for a star. Her whole life was transformed when that happened. She became somebody else. She became somebody. 
Yolanda would eventually quit her nursing job to work for Selena full-time. The next few years were a heady period in Selena's career. Her 1994 album Amor Prohibido reached number one on the Billboard Latin chart. That same year, her album Selena Live won a Grammy Award for Best Mexican American Album. It's great. It's an honor, totally. I was just happy to be nominated and just to be around all the stars. <laughs> I was there with my camera trying to take pictures. <laughs> Despite her success, Selena impressed fans with her easygoing style. Thank you. Hi, Dr. She was seen as a singer of the people. <laughs> thank you very much. Gracias. Okay, thank you. Well, when I'm not performing or I don't have to do special TV things, I like to be like this. Do that. Just like anybody else. <laughs> this is more for show. <laughs> she was just uh, a good human being. And people understand that instinctively. Then I think they saw that in Selena. As the singer matured, she began to assert her independence. Over her father's objections, she married the band's guitarist, Chris Perez. She also launched her own clothing line and opened two boutiques called Selena Etc. One in her hometown of Corpus Christi and another in San Antonio. As fan club president, Yolanda Saldivar was doing a commendable job. So when Selena needed a store manager, her father suggested Saldivar. Selena eventually hired Yolanda to manage both boutiques. To be honest with you, we like Yolanda. We would inv invite her to go meet at her house, you know. I don't think Selena ever saw the fact that there are people who want to manipulate you. She trusted too much. And I think Yolanda Saldivar used that to her advantage. Selena and her father would soon begin to doubt that Yolanda Saldivar was an honest employee. When they confronted her with evidence that she was stealing money from the Selena fan club, she snapped. That's next. In the days following Selena's death, the story of her killer, Yolanda Saldivar, and the events leading up to the homicide quickly emerged. I just hope that they get that lady for killing her. Amid the public outrage in Corpus Christi, Texas, it was a challenge for the court to find a lawyer willing to represent Saldivar. Attorney Douglas Tinker agreed to take the case, despite his wife's protests. She said, okay, you can take it, but for God's sake, don't win it. And I said, well, you know, from what I hear about the case, uh, that there's, uh, it's going to be a tough case to win. On April 6th, 1995, a grand jury indicted Saldivar for first-degree murder. She pleaded not guilty. She didn't appear to have much of a case. Prosecutors had to sign confession in which she admitted to the shooting. But two crucial developments threatened to complicate matters for the state. First, in July, a Texas Ranger named Robert Garza revealed damaging information about the police interrogation. Garza had been outside the room at the Corpus Christi police station where Saldivar's confession was taken. He said he overheard Saldivar say the shooting was an accident, an explanation that had not been included in her sworn statement by lead detective Paul Rivera. The position she took that Mr. Rivera was not telling the truth, that I told him it was an accident, he wouldn't put it in there. Uh, you know, I had a tendency not to believe her about that. And then all of a sudden, the Texas Ranger comes up and verifies that's what happened. Then the defense received a tip that Saldivar's standoff with police had been recorded. Up to that point, police had not revealed the existence of the tapes. Now, they were released. And there it was. Saldivar's repeated claims that the shooting was an accident laid out over nearly five hours of tape. It was an accident. I swear to God, it was an accident. As the case progressed, everything she told me, we ended up finding out was true. I was excited about her honesty to me. As the defense grew more confident, pressure in the DA's office was mounting to get a conviction. 
Every single thing we were doing was under a microscope, and the microscope was real big. From the start to the finish, I kept saying, this is a simple case of murder. That's what we intend to prove. The prosecution focused its attention on Saldivar's obsessive behavior in the months leading up to the shooting and her actions following it. Beginning in January 1995, Selena's father began receiving phone calls and letters from angry members of the fan club. They claimed they had paid their enrollment fee and had not received the promised memorabilia. Abraham Quintanilla had also been noticing that Saldivar was acting strangely at Selena's concerts. Somebody tried to get close to Selena, she would, you know, try to, and I would get after her. I said, Yolanda, that's not your job. I got bodyguards to take care of Selena. You know, I started noticing a lot of little things like that, you know, uh, that I felt like, hmm, huh, she looks like she's a little obsessed with Selena. There was a sense of manipulation all the way through as far as you want to get to Selena, you got to go through me. Selena's father investigated the fan club complaints and found what he considered proof that Saldivar was embezzling funds. With his daughters, Selena and Suzette, he called a meeting the night of March 9th in Selena's office at the family's recording studio to confront Yolanda. We presented the evidence. Her answers were ridiculous, you know. We asked her, you know, Yolanda, why this and this and that? And she would say, I don't know. Selena's father told Saldivar that he was going to report her to the police. We thought that that was the triggering event, and that was the first step in leading up to the murder. The next morning, March 10th, Yolanda tried to enter the recording studio. Selena's father ran her off the premises, telling her she was no longer welcome. The next day, Saldivar walked into a gun store in San Antonio called A Place to Shoot and applied for a gun. She lied to the clerk, saying she was a nurse who needed the weapon for protection from a patient's hostile relatives. Two days later, she picked up a 38 caliber revolver. While the Quintanilla family had told Yolanda that their relationship was over, Selena stayed in touch with her. In fact, Selena told Yolanda she still needed her help in setting up another boutique in Monterey, Mexico. So the two women remained in regular contact. According to prosecutors, Yolanda was so pleased that she had not been cast out by her idol that she actually returned the gun she had bought. And yet, as Selena began pressuring Yolanda to return important business documents, Saldivar bought the gun again. Near the end of March, Saldivar was in Mexico on business, where an associate says she seemed devastated and often wept inconsolably. On March 30th, she returned to Texas and checked into room 158 at the Days Inn Motel. Around 11 p.m. that night, Selena and Yolanda met. Yolanda handed over some of the business documents, and Selena returned home. Later, Yolanda contacted Selena at her house. She claimed she had been raped in Mexico and said she needed a doctor. Selena agreed to take her to the hospital in the morning. Around 9 a.m., the singer left her husband sleeping in bed and picked up Yolanda. At the hospital, it was clear Selena didn't believe the rape story. When Yolanda's physical exam proved inconclusive, Selena pulled the nurses aside and told them she thought her friend was lying. The women returned to the motel. Prosecutors believe Saldivar was now desperate and angry. She knew it was over and she was out. And I think in many respects her life was over because whatever uh, status she had gained through her association with Selena uh, was gone for whatever reason. Possibly because Yolanda thinking, well, if I can't be around you, no one can. 
Only Yolanda Saldivar could fully explain what happened in room 158. Prosecutors plan to argue that at some point just before noon, Selena determined the relationship was over and removed a friendship ring that Yolanda had given her. When Selena takes that ring off, that's the final blow. She couldn't control her anymore. She couldn't manipulate her anymore. So she wasn't going to let that happen. And the final act of control, the final act of manipulation was to kill her. Then prosecutors believe Saldivar took out the gun, aimed it at Selena, and pulled the trigger. The ring was found clutched in Selena's hand in the ambulance. She had been shot in the back. Yolanda recalled the events surrounding the shooting very differently. She claims she didn't buy the gun out of anger, as prosecutors allege, but because Selena's father had threatened her repeatedly after he had accused her of stealing money from the fan club. She was threatened by Mr. Quintanilla. She was fearful of Mr. Quintanilla. In fact, the day of the shooting, Yolanda had a copy of a letter of resignation addressed to Selena in her possession. It read, The day-to-day -day dealings with certain members of your family has made it impossible to work for you. In a motel room, according to the defense, Yolanda was planning to commit suicide right in front of her idol. But as she gestured with the gun, it went off accidentally. She claims she didn't even know whether Selena was hit and that she was in her truck looking for Selena when police arrived. A jury would now decide whether it was intentional murder or a tragic accident. A key to Yolanda Saldivar's version of events was the idea that the gun she owned could have accidentally misfired. This was the same gun that she had safely held to her head during her nine and a half hour standoff with police. In court, the prosecutor would try to dispel that defense theory by holding Yolanda's gun to his own head. Texas versus Yolanda Saldivar, when American justice returns in a moment. Six months after Selena's death, in October 1995, hundreds of her fans showed up in Houston for the trial of her killer, Yolanda Saldivar. If you lived anywhere south of a line between, say, San Antonio and Houston, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, I think this was the trial of the century. The trial had been moved to Houston from Corpus Christi after Judge Mike Westergren agreed with the defense that Saldivar could not get a fair trial in Corpus Christi because of the intense publicity about the crime and the popularity of Selena in the city. Just six days before the trial was to begin, the verdict of the O.J. Simpson criminal trial came in. The press began calling this the Hispanic O.J. Security was extremely tight. Police with bomb-sniffing dogs canvassed the courthouse. The defendant was escorted in and out under heavy guard. They had, you know, six or eight people with uh, bulletproof vests and helmets bring her to the courtroom every day, and they were coming through tunnels uh, for her safety, they claim, and I just think it was showboating on, on the part of law enforcement. But inside the courtroom, the atmosphere lacked the sensational character many expected. While we were in the courtroom, it was calm. It was like you're in, in the center of a hurricane, in the eye of a hurricane. Judge Westergren had made sure of that. He barred cameras, allotted only two days for jury selection, and limited opening arguments to half an hour. I'm not really a control freak, but uh, when it comes to my job, I think that I am the one that controls what goes on as far as the the courtroom. Once the lawyers take over, then there's havoc. In his opening statements, prosecutor Carlos Valdez took only 10 minutes to tell the jury that he would prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the shooting was an intentional act of murder. 
that Saldivar killed Selina in a senseless and cowardly act of violence. Defense attorney Douglas Tinker contended it was all a tragic accident, that Saldivar was like a sister to Selina and would never have harmed her on purpose. He promised to show that Selina's father had frightened Saldivar to the point where she bought a gun for protection and was suicidal on the day she shot Selina. The state called witnesses from the Days Inn Motel who testified to seeing Saldivar run after Selina with a gun pointed at her back. Housekeeper Norma Martinez claimed that after the shooting, she heard the defendant call Selina a bitch, then return to room 158. I think her, her actions right after the shooting occurred revealed a lot. She didn't react like somebody who had just accidentally shot somebody. She reacted pretty much like somebody who intended to kill somebody. During cross-examination, the defense was able to cast doubt on the housekeeper's account by hammering away at the fact that in her original statement to police, she had never mentioned a nasty comment about Selena. I think witnesses in this case lied. Some of the people working at Days Inn uh, exaggerated their testimony, uh, added to their testimony, uh, just because of the high-profile kind of case it was. The prosecution argued that the physical evidence from the motel only provided more proof that the shooting was no accident. Crime scene photos showed blood on the door of the motel room and on the sidewalk. Saldivar, by her own admission, had walked through that door three times after the shooting. Was it possible, as she claimed, that she didn't know Selena had been hit? Yolanda Saldivar is kind of short. She passed through that door jam onto that sidewalk three times without stepping in this large puddle of blood, taking little short steps. That's large because she had to look down and see that blood and step over it. The prosecution turned to perhaps the most contentious piece of evidence, the audio tapes of Saldivar's standoff with police. The defense planned to use them to prove that Saldivar was telling the truth. During the standoff, Saldivar had insisted the shooting was an accident. I am so sorry. I know you're sorry. <laughs> I know you're sorry. It was very emotional for her. She started hearing her own voice uh, uh, saying uh, that she didn't do it in, in, intentionally, that uh, she was trying to kill herself. and. Uh, that probably brought back all her fears of, of, of that night. While the tapes played, Saldivar broke down and cried. But prosecutors argued that the tapes did not show that Saldivar was genuinely sorry. Instead, they said that Yolanda concocted the idea of an accidental shooting after a negotiator tried to comfort her by telling her that sometimes guns just go off. Maybe there was an accident. Maybe there was a mistake. Maybe, maybe there was a faulty gun. It was a mistake. The prosecution also had to deal with the charge of police misconduct surrounding Saldivar's confession. Texas Ranger Robert Garza took the stand to tell his story about overhearing Saldivar tell police the shooting was an accident and that despite her claim, Police did not include it in the confession they wrote for her to sign. Detective Paul Rivera testified that Saldivar was given every opportunity to change the confession. The statement was there. She stopped me several times to make corrections. She could have put a, a, a next in the whole thing and put accident. When the state rested its case, Douglas Tinker had little to offer. The defense decided that Yolanda Saldivar would not testify. They didn't believe her when she was saying it in the truck. Were they more likely to believe her if she'd say it again? And we decided no. Tinker also surprised observers by not even cross-examining Selena's father, whom he had accused of threatening Saldivar to the point where she decided to buy a gun. We felt that uh, 
the jury might resent us beating up on the father of the deceased in the case, that they might not like us for doing that. In closing arguments, Prosecutor Valdez left the jury with a lasting image. Through part of his presentation, he held the murder weapon to his own head in order to make a point. I don't think it's a coincidence that for nine hours she holds police at bay with the gun. She has it cocked, she has it to her head, she's fiddling with the radio, she's talking to the police on the phone, she's doing uh, all these things, talking to a bunch of people with the gun cocked and to her head, and it never goes off. And then one single time that she points it at Selena, she just points it at her, it accidentally shoots? No. No, you can't believe that. When she pointed at Selena, she meant to pull the trigger. As the jury deliberated, they examined the gun themselves. The first thing that I wanted to do when the evidence came in, personally, was to feel the trigger pull on the weapon to see if it was a hair trigger or if it required effort to pull the trigger. You had to put pressure on it to get the hammer to fall. Do I think she meant to shoot Selena when the weapon discharged? Yes, I do. It took just two hours for the jury to find Yolanda Saldivar guilty of first-degree murder. The jury was clearly not swayed by Saldivar's repeated claims on the standoff tapes that the shooting was an accident. But there was still the matter of her sentence. Yolanda faced a possible life term in prison. So now the question was whether she would show any genuine remorse about killing Selena. Back in a moment with the conclusion of American Justice. In late October 1995, Yolanda Saldivar was convicted of the first-degree murder of Tejano singing star Selena. And now faced a possible life sentence. Some of Selena's fans made it clear that one way or another, justice would be done. If they don't, if they don't put her in prison, she won't be here too long. I guarantee that. Somebody will get rid of her. At her sentencing hearing, the prosecution argued that nothing short of life in prison was an appropriate punishment for the woman who killed Selena. Prosecutor Carlos Valdez even challenged the jury to deduct time for anything Saldivar had done right. In this case, there was nothing like that. Nothing to mitigate a life in prison. Nothing to show that, uh, that she had any remorse, that she tried to help Selena. Saldivar's father took the stand on his 69th birthday to make a plea for leniency. He turned to the jury and before the prosecution could object, posed a question of his own. Did they believe in God? More than half of the jurors' hands shot up. I felt compassion for him. That's his daughter. He loves her. And I understand that. I understand that very well. On October 26th, the jury was ready to announce Saldivar's fate. When the jury came in, she grabbed my hand and she started saying, Oh, Mr. Tinker. Oh, Mr. Tinker. And she said it over and over. To me, it was sad. She, I think in her soul, knew something bad was going to happen to her. The jury gave Saldivar the maximum sentence, life in prison. There was really no celebrating going on in the courtroom, no celebrating afterwards, uh, because the uh, devastation of two families I don't think is anything to celebrate about. I remember how, how much it resembled the, the crying at a funeral. It sounded like there had been two deaths instead of one. But outside, Selena's fans did celebrate, feeling that justice had been done. Yes, we gave her life, we gave her life! Yolanda Saldivar was sent to a women's prison in Gatesville, Texas. Because of the many death threats she received, she was placed in isolation. To this day, she maintains she told the truth. I did not kill Selena. It was an accident. And my conscience is clear. 
Well, my reaction to that is, <clears throat> how can you have a clear conscience? Let's say, let's say that it was an accident. You know, if I kill somebody, even accidentally, my conscience would be eating at me. It's not normal, it's not right. Saldivar is currently appealing her case. Perhaps her strongest argument concerns her confession. During her standoff with police, a negotiator can be heard asking if she wanted a lawyer. Saldivar clearly answered yes. Do you want to talk to your attorney? <laughs> you want to get, you want, when you come out of the truck, do you want to call him first? Richard? Richard Garza? Didn't, isn't that what you said his name was? Yeah. You want to talk to him first? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But in custody, she signed the confession without an attorney present. The law is that if a person asks for a lawyer, you have to stop interrogation. Lie to her. Lie to her all they could. Tell her we'll give you a lawyer and, and not give her a lawyer. You think that's fair? I don't think anybody thinks that's fair. It's our contention that the statement should never have been taken to begin with. It was inaccurate, and the uh, uh, act of allowing the jury to consider that statement was highly prejudicial to her rights uh, in the case. The state of Texas maintains that negotiators cannot be held responsible for promises they make during a standoff with an armed suspect. Further. They point out that Saldivar was read her rights at the police station and decided to speak without a lawyer anyway. <laughs> Selena's untimely death, like that of many celebrities, has only increased her popularity. Fans still flock to her grave the family's recording studio, and other sites dedicated to her memory. Soon after her death, EMI Latin released the English language album that she was working on at the time of her murder. In 1997, Selena's father served as executive producer on a film about his daughter's life. The film did not address the question that has haunted Selena's fans ever since her murder. Why did Yolanda Saldivar do it? We could ask ourselves why, why, why? And we can talk about it for a hundred years and I don't think you'll ever get an answer as to why. Because the only person who knows why is denying that it happened and will never ever admit it, never. It's as fresh in our mind as if it happened this morning. You know, and I guess it would be like that for the rest of our lives. In death, Selena was honored in a style usually accorded to saints. Shrines, murals, and memorials popped up all over Texas. Governor George W. Bush designated Selena's birthday, April 16th, 1995, as Selena Day. For her fans, the fact that the date coincided with Easter seemed appropriate. The trial of Selena's killer lasted just three weeks. Coming as it did in the wake of the circus known as the O.J. Simpson trial, this one was praised as an example of justice moving smoothly, despite intense media scrutiny. Yolanda Saldivar was perhaps the one person who would have reveled in that kind of media sensation. On the day of her sentencing, as she awaited her fate, there was an odd sight. A convicted killer making light of the proceedings by signing autographs for both reporters and spectators in the gallery. I'm Bill Curtis. Join me next time for another episode of American Justice here on A&E.